The notion of alone and together has been very familiar in my life. Um, I come from a country of 1.3 billion people, so there's not really such a thing as being alone. You may think you're alone sometimes, but it's really an illusion. Um, and then growing up between India and the US, I really understood what it was to be alone. I've spent most of my life on stage completely feeling alone. I've been in front of crowds my whole life, and even then, I've always been able to hide behind the illusion of this constructed intimacy, behind technology, hiding behind distance, being in a room full of people and feeling completely alone. But as we all know, we all want more than that. We have this need for this immediate intimacy upon demand, whether it's performing on stage or swiping away at fellow humans on dating apps over coffee with friends. It's this constant need. And I think, for me, this need for love without having to quite reveal yourself in any sort of way, the need for wanting everything without ever having to give yourself away. And I come from a unique situation in the sense that I had an identity before I was born. I was the daughter of a famous Indian violinist. I was the granddaughter of a famous Indian vocalist related to famous Indian musicians, probably the most famous Indian musician of all time. But within that, I was surrounded by people since I was little, but really felt alone and didn't quite understand why. I grew up without my mother, without my family, and there was always this hope of wanting to find real connections. And I found hope in one of the most unexpected places, and I'd like to tell you a story about that. Even now, I wake up in the middle of the night wanting to call my mother wanting to ask her what ingredient I'm missing in my mint chutney, what that old uncle in India's name is, and what I'm supposed to do over my latest heartbreak. And it hits me every time that she's gone. The ground beneath me no longer feels secure, and suddenly I'm the adult. This larger-than-life character, the center of my universe, was the age I am now. I don't know if it hits me because I'm getting older, or because my all-knowing, ever-powerful mother didn't know any more about life than I do now. That would be fine in normal circumstances, but my mother, who used to sing me lullabies, was also a shunker. When I was growing up, they used to be at lots of concerts. My grandmother and my mother would play all the time. They'd sing with Ravi Shankar, George Harrison, but they didn't really talk about it, and I didn't really understand. In passing, they'd mention, yeah, we used to tour a little bit, we performed, but that's just who these women were. If you asked them more than that, they were completely modest, and I never quite understood their power. So I used to ask my grandmother these questions all the time. Tell me more about your touring. Tell me what you did. And it was always the same answer, you know? Stop asking us questions. Nobody wants to hear our story. Get over it. So growing up as a Shankar, the legacy was very complicated for me because most people I knew only really heard of my great uncle, Ravi Shankar. They'd never really heard about the women, heard about the musicians. So at some point, I decided I had to tell this story. And I kept bugging my grandmother about these stories. A few years before she passed away, I finally got her to relent. She gave me some old instruments and scrapbooks, and I asked her every question I'd ever wanted to ask her. And these conversations would change the course of my life. Born in 1926, my grandmother, Lakshmi Shastri, grew up in Madras. Her mother, Vishalakshi, despite having no formal education at her own, insisted that her daughter was talented and should be educated just like the boys. Her father, R.V. Shastri, was the first editor of Gandhi's newspaper, Harijan. At the age of 13, my grandmother was discovered as a talented dancer by the prestigious Uday Shankar dance troupe at the Almora Center. My grandmother was just a child, 13 years old, but she wanted to lead the life of an artist. She traveled all over the world performing, and at the age of 15, she was married off to fellow troop member Rajendra Shankar at the age of 15. He was 36, 21 years older than her. The Shankars toured all over Europe, Russia, and the US, bringing Indian music and dance to the West for the first time. She was a celebrated star, performing everywhere. It was her dream. 
and at the age of 18, she had her first child. She was on top of the world, starring in movies, ballets, and then at the age of 20, she was diagnosed with pleurisy and told that she could never dance again. But my grandmother refused to step into the shadows, so she was destined for the stage. She started studying Indian classical vocal and within five years became one of the top Indian classical vocalists in India. She was a sudden, shocking breakout star coming out of nowhere. She toured all over the country, performing in 14 languages and recording multiple albums. Critics and music critics all agreed that she had a melodious voice and a five octave range. My grandmother was 36 and my mother was 10. By all accounts, everyone that remembers my mother said she was a mischievous dreamer with an incredible voice. She grew up, up around her mother, who was a musician and wanted to follow in her footsteps. But the family had other ideas. She was a girl. They wanted her to be a proper girl and get married. So she used to sneak into her room at night and listen to the old radio. She'd listen to the old Bollywood songs, and every night she'd practice and practice and listen. One night on the radio, it was announced that there was a competition for the biggest radio station in India that was going across the country finding the best singer. It was kind of an early version of American Idol. My mother snuck out of the house and entered the competition when it came to Bombay. She was so excited, she had never been out and sung in public before. So she entered the auditorium to a young bunch of faces in front of a panel of judges, and she waited and waited and waited. When it was her time to go up on stage, she walked up nervously, and for the first time outside of her own room, anonymously in front of a large crowd on national radio. She sang in public. And she won the whole competition. My mother was a starlet overnight, just like her mother. The first prize of the competition was for her to record an album. She was 19 years old, but she never got to finish that record because the family decided that she should go to London to go to beauty school. It was during that time that some Londoners come to India, the Beatles. George Harrison heard some music that would change his life. George Harrison and Ravi Shankar struck up a musical friendship that would change a cultural phenomenon. This was the moment Indian music exploded into the West. George brought Ravi and 16 members of his Indian orchestra to London to record an album. This musical friendship culminated into the Ravi Shankar Music Festival of India tour. That's my mother, Viji, in the blue sari, and my grandmother, Lakshmi, in the green sari. They played a huge part in the tour's success, performing to large audiences every night, touring with the top pop musicians of the day and revered by Hollywood stars. I only found out recently that my grandmother also conducted the orchestras and did arrangements when Ravi got sick. It was there that my mother met my father, the violin player, and soon she was married off. And then I was born. My father always wished that I was a boy. I'm pretty sure that I was a disappointment to him within the first seconds of my life. <laughs> As he once told me, I'm not a boy, I can't carry his name on, and I can't light his cremation fire. I always knew that my dad was a musician, but not my mother, even though all my earliest memories of her were singing. When I was nine and she was 35, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. She would go into remission, she'd get worse, every time a little worse. I remember in those moments hearing her sing, and she was trying to finish this record that she created when she was 19, the record she never got to finish. She never would finish that record. Last summer, I finally went in to go listen to her old recordings, recordings that I'd put away for a long time, recordings that I couldn't listen to till I was ready and something in me had changed. I realized on the search for my grandmother that the person I was looking for my whole life was my mother. She was what was missing, she was what I needed. And these recordings, these songs, were her in her own voice, in her own words. And 
it finally hit me that I felt so many guilt and boundaries being a woman and an artist, but I saw how they struggled and they fought and those struggles became mine. And having a daughter, I want nothing more than for her to live her life outside of these boundaries. There's this habit that I have before I perform. I pace, I tune my instrument, I pace, I pace some more. I think I pace out of nervousness, out of uncertainty that my voice won't carry forward. In those moments, I have to think of my mother's lullabies, her voice. I let them sing through me and carry me through. My mother always said, women are resilient. They will be remembered through their songs. So I'm going to leave you with one of hers.
Vice President David Roger.